Hi, I'm Paul Pidriana, Engineering Manager for the Graphics Team at Oculus. The Graphics Team at Oculus implements the graphics runtime for the Rift. That's uh, what you know of as distortion, time warp, async time warp, and uh, as we announced today, async space warp. Um, I'm here representing the graphics team and also what we call the systems team at Oculus, which implements other parts of the runtime and the API, such as uh, the touch and the boundary system. I'm going to talk about that stuff first and then get into async space warp and some other topics after that. There is a disclaimer there. Oculus SDK is subject to the latest version of the Oculus SDK license agreement. Here are the topics that I'm going to cover. Touch controllers, the Guardian system, async space warp, some perf APIs and tools, uh, some notes about laptops and support for them, and then uh, some top application problems, something of a top 10 list of issues to be aware of. First off, touch controllers. Here we have a picture of a touch controller, the anatomy of a touch controller showing the, the button inputs and the trigger inputs. Um, these are, uh, as you can see, thumbsticks and triggers and uh, uh, buttons. Uh, recall that digital buttons are on-off buttons, uh, while analog buttons are buttons that have a range, in our case, from 0 to 1. So our triggers are analog, and the A, B, X, Y buttons are on-off buttons. Um, on the bottom there, you can see what we have is a grip trigger um, slash hand trigger. In our API, up till now, we've called it the hand trigger. But the, um, the um, Oculus has decided in the last week to rename that, this final name, as part of the touch release as a grip button. Uh, similarly, um, the trigger, as you can see there in the center bottom, is in our SDK called the index trigger. It's being renamed to trigger. I'll talk about that a little more lately and, and how to make sure you're compatible and aware of the differences or the, the, the fact that those are the same. Um, all right, those are button inputs. Next is capacitive inputs. Capacitive inputs indicate the touch of your fingers on the controller as opposed to button pressing. In fact, the capacitance of this is why we call this a touch controller. The, the, the capacitance inputs are indicated up there, thumbstick, AB buttons. If your finger's touching that, uh, you're notified as part of that, including the index trigger. What I have here is a picture of some of the, uh, some of the gestures that you can detect with the capacitive touch input. You saw some of these earlier today in Brendan's keynote. Um, this is just a subset of what you can do. Um, it's useful for basic hand states, such as pointing, grabbing, basic gestures. Uh, you can draw virtual hands as a result. And if you want, you can try our Avatar SDK, which handles some of this for you. It turns out the Avatar SDK is in this same room right after this. It's the next talk after this one. And they'll go over the API that you can use for that. Programmatically, input is... Uh, acquired through our OVR input state struct. This is a compressed version of that struct, uh, which is uh, in our current public API. Uh, this, you can see the first item there is time in seconds. That time refers to when the sampling was taken. It doesn't refer to when you made the API call. So it represents when the button went down uh, for higher precision. The buttons and touches there are bit flags that indicate which buttons you're pressing and what you're touching. Um, notice how below that it says index trigger. That's the one that we renamed to trigger, and below that hand trigger, which is now called grip button. Um, just last week in our API header, I modified the header to add a bunch of comments indicating what the renames are and how they correspond to Xbox controller inputs, touch controller inputs, uh, and the renames of them. So if you just look at the header file, you'll see uh, everything should be pretty explanatory. Uh, you also get the controller type as part of that input state. Um, and at the bottom, there are some uh, inputs called no dead zone. Th you'll notice that those are similar to some inputs that are above it. No dead zone simply means that, you know how when you move a thumbstick around and there's that little bit of space in the center which has some noise? That does not account for that. Even the little bit of noise that's in the center, that those bottom no dead zone uh, elements will report. <clears throat> 
Okay, I mentioned a minute ago about the OVR controller type. This is an enumeration that tells you when you receive input which controller was giving you that input. Uh, for, um, there's L touch and R touch, but there's also touch, which indicates both controllers. Um, and uh, to get the input, you call, as we can see at the bottom, the OVR get input state function. You pass to that the controller type that you want. Now, while the touch controllers, the Oculus Remote and the Xbox are listed there, at the bottom you can see OVR controller type active. The active controller type means the current controller. And it turns out that that current type of controller is automatically detected by the runtime. If you're using the Xbox controller and you put it down and then you pick up the touch controllers, it'll automatically detect that for you. So it's best practice for most applications to use, to request input from the active controller. In addition to reading the buttons from input, you can also re uh, read the position. Um, and if, if uh, you've used this API before, you recognize the OVR get tracking state function. What we've done for touch is add two additional parameters there, hand poses and hand status flags. Hand poses tells you where in space and what direction in space the controllers are facing. This is better than standard controller IMUs, which simply indicate acceleration in a given direction. This is much more precise. It tells you exactly where you are in space. You can use the differences between that to derive, to derive gestures in a way that's more precise than what you're used to with, for example, console platforms. Hand status flags indicates whether the controller is present and being tracked. So if you take a controller, throw it in the drawer, and then you get where its position is, that'll just return a zero in the field that says whether it's being tracked or not. So you can tell whether the controller is even present. <clears throat> All right, I've got some differences here between touch controllers and Xbox controllers. You'll notice that they look similar, and we even use the same uh, A, B, X, Y, uh, and thumbstick type of conventions with triggers. But there are some differences uh, that you want to know about when we're trying to write portable applications. Touch controllers don't have bumpers, which is this top button right here on Xbox controllers. It doesn't have a D-pad, which is the arrow buttons, and it doesn't have the view button, which is the, the one little mini right button on an, on an Xbox controller. Uh, while it doesn't have those, touch has capacitive input. It has the grip button, also known as the hand trigger in our API currently. Uh, it has position and orientation, as I mentioned before, and it also has more advanced vibration, which I'm going to go into next. <clears throat> Here's some notes about touch. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the hand trigger has been renamed grip button. Index trigger has been renamed trigger. 1.9 SDK still uses the old names, but uh, we're going to do something to update that uh, in an upcoming SDK. One thing to know about this, which is important, is that Button press latency is 10 milliseconds, while capacitance latency is 20 milliseconds. If you think about that, what that means is that if, you're, if your finger is above a touch controller and you really quickly press it down and press a button, you could actually rec you could, uh, deliver the button press before the capacitance is registered, um, only, only if you move really fast. Um, and, um, but the, the key takeaway from that is you don't want to become dependent in the way that you write your code to, to become dependent on that. In either case, 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds is actually, it's very fast. That's like the, the, in the realm of the time of a frame, if not faster. Um, capacitance currently doesn't report finger distance. It reports whether the, the, your finger's touching or very close to the, to the surface or whether it's completely off. Uh, there's not a distance figure. Um, if, if you have a use case for distance and you feel like you have the killer app that's going to benefit from that, let us know and we can, uh, we can talk about possibilities of that in the future. Um, here I introduce this concept of a touch controller TRC. If you've developed for consoles, you've heard of this term before, TRC, Technical Requirements Checklist. What it means is the standard set of things that you need to do in order for an application to be proper to give the user a, a consistent ex experience. Uh, we have some TRCs here for using touch controllers. One is to use OVR controller type active to get input from the currently active controller. The benefit of that is it means your application is automatically portable between touch and Xbox controllers and Oculus and remote for that matter. Um, Avoid requiring touch controller movements that put them out of sensor visibility. So you don't want to have a, some, something that requires the, the user to, to you know, hide the controller somewhere where it's impossible for, to, to be seen by anything. Uh, also, use buttons naturally. 
uh, a trigger should be the firing button if you have a, a, an application that's acting like a, with the touch controllers as a gun, for example. Also, make parallel button mappings between touch controllers and Xbox controllers. People might be switching back and forth, or someone, someone in one place might have one, or, and another person in another place have the other. So if you have an A button that works on the Xbox controller, you want to have that A button also work on the touch controller. Um, as I said earlier, don't assume that cap touch will be registered before a button press. It's possible that for one frame, those two can be reversed. All right, next thing to talk about here for touch controller is haptics, um, also known as vibration. Uh, uh, each controller can, of course, vibrate independently. Uh, the vibration capabilities of the touch controller are significantly more flexible than Xbox in terms of range, precision, and response. The Xbox controller um, uses uh, a rotational uh, vibration, whereas the touch controllers use what we call an LRA, linear resonance actuator, uh, which is, it's like a speaker, but imagine taking the center part of a speaker and, and putting a weight on it, so it's, it's moving, the speaker is instead moving a weight around. Uh, that's essentially how that works. Um, it's, it's, it's the future of haptics, um, and more and more devices you'll see will have that kind of stuff. Um, the vibration of the touch controller is 320 hertz with controllable amplitude, it stops when your application loses visibility automatically, um, and it automatically stops after a short time if you uh, don't refresh it. So if you make a call to turn it on and then your app just goes AWOL, it'll, it'll stop automatically. The latency on vibration is also 10 milliseconds. So when you start uh, vibration, it'll take 10 milliseconds before it shows up. That's actually pretty fast. That's on the order of less than a, a V-Sync. Uh, we have two APIs for, for controlling touch. We have a simple API, which is here, which is similar to the one you may have seen on our SDK in, in the past, uh, OVR set controller vibration. It's a really simple API where you just set a frequency and an amplitude, um, and it just each time you call it, it pulses it for 2.5 seconds, uh, and that's about it. Um, one thing to note here, um, and this is something I'm going to bring up in a few other slides, it may return OVR success device unavailable. What that means is that your call succeeded, but the device didn't exist. So if there don't have any touch controllers and you set the vibration on it, it it'll, it'll return success, but device unavailable, which means it had no effect. Um, if it returned an error code, that would mean that your application or our runtime is in an error state, uh, which is a much more serious situation. It's an actual error. Whereas this isn't an error, it just says, hey, you know, the, the, the controller wasn't there. All right, now we also have an advanced API. Uh, the advanced API has three functions, get, ha get touch haptics desk, submit controller vibration, and get controller vibration state. Uh, what this essentially does is it allows you to supply a waveform. You, send a, you, you specify a buffer, and the buffer is an amplitude waveform, which it automatically executes for you, kind of like a wave file. And in fact, we have samples that will load a wave file and execute a wave file on the touch controller. Um, the, you can also get the haptic, get haptics just provides information about what the, what the bit rate of this buffer is. Um, and the, the last function down there, get vibration state, just tells you where you are, like you're halfway through um, this, this buffer, there's so many milliseconds left before the buffer's done and whatnot. You can, you can call this API again and it'll immediately start playing the, whatever you submit uh, immediately thereafter to override what you had before. Uh, this API only applies to touch controllers. It does not and will never, as far as we know, apply to anything like Xbox controllers uh, or, or our Oculus remote. It's touch controller specific. All right, next topic, Guardian system. This right here, here's a picture of it. You've probably seen some of this already, especially if you've been on the floor. What this does is this implements um, uh, a boundary around you, and what it's showing here is the case of a hand that's going up against the boundary and highlighting the boundary in addition to showing it. It's just a little demo picture. But here's a more uh, descriptive explanation of how it is. In, uh, there's two types of boundaries that you can see there. There's an outer boundary and there's a play area boundary, and that's what they're called in the SDK. The outer boundary is simply what the user scribes with the touch controller during setup, and that can be an arbitrary shape. That it was, that was my sloppy at-home shape that I generated last week there. The a play area is an axis-aligned bounding box, uh, which is within that area. And um, the play area is normally the area that your application should work within. The boundary system itself, um, when it shows on the screen, however, is displaying the outer boundary. 
<clears throat> All right, here's some behavior descriptions here. The boundary becomes visible when you get close to the outer boundary, not that play area, but the outer boundary. It draws a virtual wall overlay that represents that boundaries. It's applied as a composited effect, which means it stomps over everything else in the scene. Uh, it, it, there's, no, there's no depth information that's being used there. Um, the, the detection of the boundary applies to the rift and the touch controllers. So if, you're, if your hands get close to the boundary, it'll, uh, it'll trigger it. If your headset gets close to the boundary, it'll trigger it. Um, there's a little bit different sensitivity. It's, it's a little bit less sensitive to your hands than to your headset. Um, but otherwise, um, if, if any of those three gets near it, that's when it gets triggered. Um, it only applies to touch controllers if they're held, right? So if you take a touch controller, throw it in the box, it'll never, uh, it'll never trigger the boundary. It's, um, the, the system automatically detects what these active controllers are, and so it knows this uh, automatically. The boundary system is in real-world coordinates specified in floor points. Um, and I have a point there about cockpit-based apps. If you're in the cockpit-based app and, this, and it has walls around you, the, the boundary system still exists in real-world coordinates, which will probably be outside of that cockpit, but um, it'll stomp over it if the user leans over far enough. Um, it's just the important thing to realize here is that it's in, it's in your real-world coordinates. It's not in your application game coordinates. It doesn't know anything about your, your application. Uh, <clears throat> all right, applications have some control here. Uh, they can query the guardian system visibility and geometry. They can query the play area. Um, they can tell, uh, they, can, they can request that it become visible. And after requesting that it becomes visible, they can request that it subsequently becomes not visible. Uh, you could conceivably augment it with overlays. In other words, if you, if you detect that you're getting close, you can draw something there yourself um, instead of the guardian system. The guardian system, if you look close enough, is gonna draw itself. Uh, you can change the RGB color of the Guardian system to, to go along with your application's theme. Uh, what applications cannot do is they cannot unilaterally disable the Guardian system. Only users of the computer can disable the Guardian system. Um, applications also cannot currently uh, replace the Guardian system and say, uh, I don't want you to draw my mesh, uh, I, I want to draw my mesh instead of your mesh. That's currently not capable. That's something we're looking into. Um, uh, for the future, but that's not currently there. All right, here's the API, which is, uh, reflects what I just said. Um, there's a test boundary function, a test boundary point function, a set look and feel function, get boundary geometry and dimensions. The get boundary dimensions function is just an axis line bounding box in case you want a, a simple rectangle. Uh, function will tell you if it's visible, and then that function I mentioned earlier will, where you can force it to be visible. Um, uh, similar to the touch controllers, there are these success return values. Uh, this API, any of those functions in that API, can return OVR success boundary invalid or OVR success device unavailable. These are successful return codes. They don't indicate an error in the system, but what the boundary invalid indicates is that the user has touch controllers, but they never went through that system of setting up the boundaries. So in a sense, there is no boundary. Um, so uh, those functions will succeed, but have no... Uh, uh, have no effect, for example, when you try to set it visible, it, it won't do anything. Device unavailable is the same case as it was before. If the controller is sitting in a, in a drawer, then uh, the, the functions that apply to it will have no, no effect. When I say functions that apply to it, you can specifically ask, is this controller near the bounds? And it'll tell you if this one is. That's, uh, and you can do that with any of the, uh, the three uh, types. All right. Okay. In addition to the boundary system that's part of the guardian system, there's also a, a lower level way of understanding where visibility is, and that's our uh, sensor enumeration API. You know, the, the sensors that we have, have a, they have a, a, a frustum and a position, so they're basically looking at you, um, as shown in the picture there. Um, and it turns out we have an API that can allow you to enumerate those. And so in a sense, you can tell where, what the visibility is yourself, and you could, if you wanted to, you could draw it. I'm not sure if that's... Um, useful in practice for most apps, but um, there's in, the information there is the frustum that the, uh, that the sensor has, in, both in terms of field of view and uh, Z near, Z far. Um, the pose that it has, so you can tell which way it's facing. Um, and uh, there's three API functions down there, get tracker count, which tells you how many of those sensors that there are. Um, get tracker desk tells you about the field of view properties. 
and get the pose. So between the three of those, you can tell how many they are and where they, what their properties are and which way they're facing. Everything you need to draw, for example, sensors uh, or calculate their visibility frustums precisely. Um, the Oculus runtime itself, unlike the, the boundary system, the runtime will never display these sensors. Uh, you would need an application to draw. You can write your own application. In fact, one of our SDK sample apps, um, which is shown here, the camera volume one, that's an example of it showing uh, the, the, the volume of a sensor right there. Uh, this is about, a, about 100 degrees by 70 degree field of view. Uh, don't make that assumption. Always call the API to check uh, so you know at runtime. All right. Next thing I'm going to talk about is the, um, uh, this topic that we've discussed this morning or that Brendan announced this morning, async space warp. Uh, as far as I know, this is the only talk here in which we're going to cover this. And, so, and this is a very, uh, for our team, this is a very exciting thing. Async time warp was a very difficult thing to bring to the PC. Um, conceptually, it's straightforward, but due to the way the PC platform works, it's very, it's, it's very difficult to get it right. Async space warp is the next, is beyond that and in its own way even trickier than uh, async time warp to implement. Async time warp, uh, async space warp implements animation detection and compensation. It doesn't replace ATW, it actually works with ATW. In fact, they, they both are really executing at the same time. It uses both the CPU and GPU to do real-time analysis of frames. Applications, when running in ASW mode, run at 45 hertz, as opposed to 90 hertz when ASW is active. Normally an application can sit there and run at 90 hertz, but if the application starts missing or maybe the detail is turned way up, the application can't keep 90 hertz, ASW kicks in and starts running at 45 hertz. Uh, ASW compensates for object animation on the screen, camera translation, head translation as opposed to rotation, but it, um, in a sense it handles rotation to some degree too. Uh, it does all these things at once. So if you're translating and the camera's moving and stuff is animating on the screen, it, it can detect all of it happening at once uh, and compensate for that. Here's a picture, uh, for example, of how what you can see on the screen effectively uh, with ASW. On the far left, you have an application that's running at 90 hertz. And what's happening is you have a ball, and the ball is just going diagonally across the screen, you know, from the top left to the bottom right. And while you're moving your head, that ball is, 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 is you're moving your head and the ball is moving at the same time. Uh, at 90 hertz, that still runs smoothly. Um, at 45 hertz, if there's no ATW, if you, th what would happen is that the um, frames would get doubled. The application submits a frame with the ball at the upper right, at the upper left. The application misses the next frame, so what do you do? You just draw it again. And then, so it misses every other frame. And if you've seen that, it's this stuttering look. Um, it doesn't just look slower, it actually, it stutters. Um, that's really bad, that's terrible. Uh, with ATW, what you get is a little bit of a jerkiness because ATW doesn't recognize that this ball is moving. It just takes the scene and moves it over. As a result, it'll effectively follow that trajectory. With ASW, it moves smoothly again because while you're moving your head, it recognizes that there's a ball on the screen that's moving diagonally, and it can detect that and smooth it out. It's, it's a huge difference. All right, now, next I have an example of nonlinear animation. In this case, we have a ball describing a little bit of an arc. It's not going in a straight direction. As a result, it makes it a little bit harder for ASW to tell where it's going because it's, it's a little bit inconsistent in where it's going. In the for, application 45 hertz case, we have the same bad judder that we saw before. In the case of ATW, you have a, a, another version of what I showed before, where instead of something going smoothly, it's, it's kind of going in a circle, but it's, but it's jerking around as it's going in a circle. With ASW, it's seeing the, it's seeing the ball move and it's seeing it rotate, but it's because it can't really guess that it's going to make a turn, it's not as precise, so the result is going to be less smooth. You as an application developer will want to keep this in mind depending uh, uh, on what kind of application you're writing, that ASW, um, while it does a great job of making things smoother, uh, it's, it's not perfect in this situation. It still looks far better. Um, here's a diagram of frame progression right here. Um, this is this typical ATW 90 hertz frame progression. If you're familiar with that, you would recognize this here. Everything that's in blue represents to what's to, to frame number two, everything that's in green is what's drawn for frame number three. Um, and that just shows, shows that overlap there. 
um, ATW kicks in each frame to, uh, to adjust the rotation of the view um, and does a slight reprojection as some people refer to it to make that work. Now, ASW is on the next frame here. It looks a little more complicated, but what's really happening here is the application is given more time to draw and when the application doesn't hit every single frame, ASW, as you can see in blue there, kicks in every other frame. ATW by itself kicks in in the other frames. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time analyzing this. You can, if some of you are taking pictures, you can look at them later, and it'll become f fairly obvious to you what's going on there. ASW benefits here. This allows most applications to be smooth at 45 hertz, which was virtually impossible before this. Lower end hardware provides quality VR experience. High end hardware works better in the face of demanding applications and potholes. Uh, even a, a GTX 1080 GPU will look better uh, with ASW um, when you give it demanding work to do. In most cases, nothing's required on the developer's part. You as a developer don't have to execute any other APIs. Uh, this just works for you for free automatically. If your application's proper now, it'll work with this. Um, there are some, a little bit later, I'm gonna talk about how your application may not be proper for this in a few cases that we've discovered. Uh, and, uh, but I'll go over that in a little later. All right, a, a practical result of this is that applications will run smoother on the Rift in many cases uh, with a single GPU than other VR systems with dual GPUs. ASW can run as good or better on a GTX 960 than other VR systems on a GTX 970. And, and ASW apps can run app with ASW applications can often run in high settings as well as other VR systems with medium and possibly even low settings. This results for you in a wider market for application sales and also, um, as was announced this morning by Brendan, greater laptop compatibility. Um, as announced this morning, in association with this, Oculus is introducing a new minimum spec for hardware. Minimum spec resents a bar for good VR on the Rift. Uh, min spec is in addition to the existing recommended spec. So if you're used to shipping games, you'll notice you often on the box, you have this idea of a min spec and a recommended spec. This is a similar thing. Um, although I think um, we discussed it internally, we, we feel that what we call min spec is actually better than what a lot of games refer to as min spec. Games from min spec is often a pretty, pretty weak thing. Min spec on the, on the Rift here with ASW works pretty, pretty well actually. Um, in addition to CPU and GPU changes, our MinSpec also in includes USB support for our sensors, uh, USB 2 support, I mean to say, for our sensors. Um, and the door is open now for computers under $500. In fact, Brendan announced a $499 computer. Uh, we will see more of this in the future, especially as uh, GPU vendors introduce um, additional GPUs with their new generations that support this. There's a lot of room here. Uh, here I have a little slide explaining or describing what this is here. Minimum spec, GTX 960, recommended spec. There's some, some stuff there, 1060 and 470. One thing you might, know, you might notice here about the minimum spec is that there's not a, an AMD uh, GPU listed. The reason why right now is because the 470 down there, which was up till now our recommended spec, the, the 470 is now is, um, is good enough to be a recommended spec GPU. So in, conceivably, we could put that minimum spec, but the 470 is good enough, we can actually lump it into rec spec. You can go on the internet and get a 470 right now for 185 bucks. Uh, so that's a, great, that's a great deal, it's the best thing going. Um, minimum spec CPUs, now those are now being lowered to an, a Core i3-6100 and an AMD FX4350. Those are sub $100 for that, uh, for the 4350. Um, recommended spec remains the same as it was before. Um, everything's being lowered here. Um, here's some requirements for ASW. You need Windows 8 Plus. Windows 7 is currently um, not included in this. Uh, it's technically possible, but it's not a focus for us, and um, it's, so we're not including it right now as, as a supported OS. Uh, you need an up-to-date graphics driver. Um, new graphics drivers coming out by the IHVs uh, this month will make um, uh, we'll take full advantage of ASW or fully support it. Um, you need the Oculus runtime 1.8 or later. Um, um, AMD is coming with um, probably the next release. Um, and I say 1.8, that's the current version. ASW actually works in what is currently shipping right now. 
Um, uh, you can tell from the log how to do it. On the next slide, I'm going to show you how you can enable ASW now in the 1.8 runtime. This works today. Set that reg key up there, and you can not, not only is that turn on ASW in the current runtime, but you get some hotkeys there to control it. With those hotkeys, what you can do is go back and forth between ASW and not ASW. It's useful for you as a developer to see the difference between the two. You can force, um, if you want to um, run a, a fast GPU but simulate what it's running like on a slower GPU, you can use um, uh, control numpad three there. Um, that, that's very useful for you to tell whether, uh, to, to tell how your application will run if it's running on a slower GPU. Um, ASW currently in 1.8 uh, and the upcoming 1.9 release is disabled in the public build, but you can use that reg key. Anyone can use this reg key to enable this. Um, but we will, be we will be enabling ASW for everybody in a near runtime, a near future runtime. Uh, even though you don't need to call any new APIs for uh, ASW, there are a few things that you need to be aware of uh, in a few cases. Um, there's currently there's no way to disable it, um, although we we're thinking about um, possibly blacklisting apps if there somehow was a special case that it didn't work right. We're also looking at making a layer flag. Uh, so if you say, no, 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 really, don't, don't implement it on this layer, you, you'd be able to set that layer flag. Um, if, if anyone has any feedback on that or ideas about that, uh, let us know. You can talk to me afterwards or just talk to our developer relations at any point in time. Um, but things to be aware of here, very flat shading. If you have a screen, if you have, a, if you have an application that's using entirely flat shaded polygons with, with no lighting or shading at all, um, the, the code that attempts to detect which things are where and where they're moving could, could have a hard time. Um, animating translucency is potentially a problem. The reason why that's the case is if you have something animating and it's translucent, and you have something that's animating and it's translucent behind it, it sometimes is not smart enough to tell which one is which. Um, and uh, that can create some artifacts on the screen in some cases. If you have very fast or jumpy animation, if you have something that's like swinging around in totally random directions really fast, um, you know, it's going to have a little bit of a hard time guessing, guessing where that's going. Um, most applications work surprisingly well with this. Um, a recommendation for applications, um, this is particularly true for headlock content, is to use layers when possible. If you have a, a HUD or you have like a text box that's showing up, it's best to put them in a layer because they'll not only allow you to do higher resolution, but they will also time warp perfectly. All right. Perf. Um, if you've been working with uh, VR for a while, you know that probably from a perf standpoint, the most important thing, uh, the most important metrics are app latency and app drop frames. Uh, in a sense, those are two versions of the same thing. Once the app latency gets out too far, the application's dropping frames. Um, a drop frame is, is, is the worst thing, but um, latency is, you know, it causes your head to be a little bit behind um, what what's you intend to draw. And um, those are key metrics, and they're, they're still relevant. Um, what we are introducing with um, the 1.8 SDK is a new API called OVR Get Per Stats. This API introduces a number of new metrics that you can use to tell in runtime how your application is running. Um, if, you, if you've seen the perf HUD, which is, shows all those, is on screen, shows all those numbers, uh, this is effectively a programmatic version of that. Uh, there's a bunch of members there, but I currently here have only five of them, with the top two being the two I just mentioned, missed frames and latency. Uh, there's other, you can look at that struct in the latest SDK, you'll see some more uh, stuff. Um, the OVR get per stats function is the one you want to use. It gets up to the last five frames of stats. Uh, if you don't call it once every five frames, then it's going to drop information. So you either call it every frame or call it every other frame or something and, and look at the old data. There's a reset function. And the reason why it's a reset function is some of that data is accumulative. It just counts how many misses there were, and sometimes you want to reset that. So, all right. Um, one other thing that's in there is a new feature that we're discussing called Adaptive GPU Performance Scale. What this is, is this is a value that we now return to you that that tells you how well your application is meeting frame rate. And, if, and this value is part of that perf API. If it returns 1.0 continuously, that means, hey, you're making frame rate fine. 
keep, keep it going as you're going. If it returns 0.8, it means, oh, you need to reduce your GPU usage by 20%. If it returns 1.2, it means you are free to actually use more GPU, maybe increase your detail, make your eye buffers a little, a little bit bigger. It targets 85% 80, GPU frame usage, uh, in case you're wondering what, what it's using as a heuristic. Um, it re reports a non 1.0 value every once in a while, so if you, it'll return 1, 1, 1, and then you'll see a 0.8, and that means, okay, I need to, I, I might want to switch down to using 0.8, but then it'll, it'll switch to showing one again. Um, just every few seconds, it pulses that value. Um, um, Unity and Unreal actually have this built in already. Uh, you have to enable it with a checkbox, but other, once you do that, it'll automatically happen, and they implement that by changing uh, eye buffer resolution. Um, and the simplest handing for you as a developer is simply to reduce the rendered area by that value. So if you get a 0.8, that means reduce your uh, 1,000 by 1,000 area to, say, 894 by 894. Uh, here's an example of it in, in practice taken from Showdown demo. On the left, you can see an application that's trying to make 90 hertz, the blue line, at, the, the blue line across the top. And you see it starts out at 90, it drops down to about 80. Then it may, gets 90 again, then it drops way down to like 70, and then it gets up to 90 again, and then drops a little more. And it's not doing anything. It's not changing its eye buffer resolution. It's just, it's, it's just failing periodically. What we do on the right, that orange line, is the perf value that we're telling it. We, we're telling it 1.0, and then it drops down, and we tell it, no, execute at 0.8 um, GPU usage, and then, say, 0.6 GPU usage. And in this case, what we measured, as you can see in the top, the application was following that, and the application is maintaining a steady 90 hertz. This is an Unreal demo, by the way, to show down Unreal demo. Um, one thing you may be wondering is that th if this thing lets you keep 90 hertz and ASW works at 45 hertz, wh which is it? Do you maintain 90 hertz with this adaptive perf, or do you let ASW take over and execute at 45 hertz? Right? If you think about it, those are like two things that are both allowing you to execute better in the face of not being able to make 90 hertz. The answer to that question is you can do it either way. You, you can let your app drop to 45 hertz and have ASW handle it, or you can reduce your eye buffer size and maintain 90 hertz. The, the, the advantage of that is that you'll have higher frame rate. The disadvantage of that is that your, your view will be more grainy. Um, and um, in the last bullet point down there, I, I have my, our suggestion is, is the more detail you want to keep, the more you lean towards ASW. Uh, if, you have, if, if you have text on the screen, fine text, it's almost always better to let ASW handle this as opposed to making a, a, a grainy uh, eye buffer. Right. Tools. Um, the, um, this is a brief um, review of the perf HUD. You've seen this before already. The only thing I have to say about this um, is that we added one feature there, a GPU N to VSync feature, which is up in the upper right there. Uh, it's new in the 1.8 runtime. It's probably useful only to people that are doing very precise measurements of what's happening under the hood. Most, most end developers aren't, aren't probably going to care about that too much. I don't have much to say about that. Also, the Oculus Debug tool. Um, if you've seen this, um, this is a tool that we've been shipping for a little while, and we're adding more features to it. You can, you can control the debug HUD. One thing that we're, um, that we're doing, uh, working on now, is adding ASW control to that. So the same hotkeys that I showed you earlier, uh, we're working on getting them into there, so you can just drop, use a drop down to get that. Um, you can also control the pixel uh, display density. Uh, there's a lot of people on Reddit saying, hey, I can make my view look better by going to the Oculus Debug tool and cranking that up. And that's basically true. You can go in there and crank that up. And um, if you have a really fast GPU, then everything will, uh, well, not everything, but a lot of stuff will look better. Um, so we're looking to exposing that into a, a more formal way in the future, which um, also in the 1.9 SDK, we have a command line version of this tool. Um, also new in the 1.9 SDK is Oculus TRC validator. Remember earlier I said this thing called TRC is a requirements checklist for applications that want to behave well. Um, and, it, and I have a, a couple examples here. Example number one, applications should always draw and submit frames when they're visible, but when you're not visible, don't draw and don't submit frames, don't use any CPU. Um, and another example is that when the display is lost, like a, um, like a TDR, uh, the application should not, the application needs to, application needs to stop. Um, there are a surprising number of applications that um, have problems um, dealing with both of these. We have applications that when they lose focus, they just keep executing, they keep submitting frames, and, they, and the users are wondering why their computer is going slow when they took their headset off. 
Um, the Oculus TRC validator is a tool that helps you automatically find these common problems by simulating these things. If you've used Windows App Validator where it automatically th you know, throws, a, throws a problem at your app and sees how your application can deal with it, that's how our TRC validator works. Here's, some, here's just some command line invocation. Uh, you, can, you can just run with dash H. You don't, you don't need to read this in detail here. See how that works. There's an example of it. And this is what the output looks like right here. Um, it's just a, uh, it, while it's doing that, it's launching your app, executing some stuff. You know, it'll, it'll simulate the, the IPD adjuster moving and making sure your application is recognizing that, for example. All right. Next, I want to talk a little bit about laptops. Um, uh, laptops are becoming more significant now because, um, as Brendan announced this morning, we have a number of new laptops that are certified as Oculus Ready, and we expect to see significantly more in the future. This is a, a big difference from just six months ago where there were hardly any laptops that were capable. Uh, in 2005, I think there was only one GPU, a, a special 980, GTX 980, that could run in laptops. Um, new generation AMD and NVIDIA hardware are changing that quite a bit. Hybrid graphics systems uh, still present challenges for laptops. That's what um, some people know as um, NVIDIA Optimus, AMD, Enduro. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Hybrid graphics is a way to transparently route your, your powerful GPU graphics to your weaker integrated GPU. It's originally conceived to deal with power savings. Um, it, the idea is that um, most of the apps on, that are running on a laptop, you know, Notepad, Microsoft Word, they don't need a powerful GPU, so run them on the integrated. You run a game, you want to run it on the discrete. The, the, the point is that your battery lasts a lot longer because the the discrete GPU is not running as, as, uh, as hard. When I say discrete, right, I mean the, the one that you plug in yourself, integrate is on the, on the chip, discrete is the one you buy separately. Um, most, most laptops today use discrete GPUs. Um, if you guys all brought laptops here, chances are almost every one of them is, has, a, um, has this hybrid graphics display that Macintosh there, and all, all Macintosh-based um, laptops also work this uh, with hybrid style. Um, I have some pictures here um, to describe how um, GPUs are configured in computers. Uh, in the top left, a typical desktop display, one GPU, everything's plugged into it. Top right is the case where you have that same thing, but you also have an integrated, right? You never notice how there's two HDMI slots sometimes on computers, one down by your card and one up in the top. That's what that is right there. The one in the top is never the one you want to use for uh, your Rift. In fact, it won't even work. Um, uh, uh, not, not currently, at least. Um, on, the, on the bottom left there, we have a, this, a type here, which is a laptop without hybrid. Um, I said a minute ago that almost all laptops have this hybrid configuration. Turns out that a very few of them don't, and a lot of the new ones coming out now, in fact, are working this way. There's no integrated GPU. It, it's just like a desktop where there's one GPU on there, and it drives the display on the laptop. It just drives any external displays. It just drives the Rift. Um, for example, the 1070s, if you go on Newegg right now and, and go and look up a 1070 or 1080 based laptop, that's how it's working. Every one of them is that way. Um, it works very well for VR. Um, now here we have a more complicated situation. The hybrid on the left is the case that most laptops have right now. Um, you have this GPU and you have an integrated GPU. You can't plug anything into the, in, directly into the GPU. Everything the GPU does has to go out through the integrated. And, um, we don't currently support that um, for various reasons. Um, on the right, however, we have a different case here where we do have a discrete, we have an integrated, but the, um, dis the discrete GPU uh, has its, act its own outputs. If you go also on Newegg today and look at 1060-based laptops, GTX 1060-based, many of them are now like this, with the HDMI that you plug into the laptop actually plugs right into the NVIDIA GPU. Um, these are supported. Um, and um, they also work pretty well. Um, there's one thing to notice, note about hybrid graphics is that um, you want to um, avoid synchronous updates of mirror windows. And what I mean by that is that if you have the case where, um, on the right here, where the laptop monitor, notice on the bottom, laptop monitor is plugged into the integrated GPU, but the Rift is plugged into the discrete. When you want to display a mirror window, it has to cop that over to the monitor, and that can present uh, performance problems. So if you detect that situation, best practice is for you to detect that and um, 
uh, schedule that asynchronously, possibly using the copy engine if you're aware of what that what that's referring to. Um, all right. Um, one other thing to be aware of for laptops, and this does apply to desktops too, is beware of non-default LUIDs. Some applications, when they create their DX device, they just use the zero index, which means the default one, the main monitor one. But the thing is, if the user has multiple GPUs, they could be plugged into another one. What you should do is check the return value from OVR create. It'll return you the LUID, which is a direct, direct um, indicator of what um, device index. Um, uh, use that as the decision for what RIF to, uh, to what um, device to use. Uh, there are a few applications out there that get this wrong. They just start up and they use zero and they work on most people's computers, but not all of them. Um, also on laptops, one last point is to be aware of bloatware. We've been doing a lot of work with laptops and we've noticed that uh, there, there's a lot of software running on these things and they're more sensitive to it um, just because they have slower hard drives, the CPUs are a, a little bit slower, um, virus detection. One thing that's happening now with Windows 10 is this big game DVR thing. GPU vendors are making game DVRs. The, the laptop maker is, is having game DVRs, and Windows 10 comes with a game DVR. You could have three different applications all doing DVRing your uh, three different systems, DVRing your app at the same time now. Um, granted, for, we're working with them to make it so that when VR is active, this is automatically disabled, um, but you may, you'll likely still run into some issues with that. All right. This next topic here, which is actually the last topic, is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, top applications problems. This is like a uh, Dave's top 10 list of things that we notice that applications do wrong. It's like the TRC thing I was mentioning earlier. Um, there are certain things an application should do to be a proper, well-behaved application. But there's a number of things that we commonly see applications get wrong, including applications that are being submitted to our store uh, even today. Um, uh, I should also, this, this TRC validator app that I referred to earlier, it can detect many of these and will hopefully detect more of them automatically in the future. All right, here's example number one. And this one's related to ASW, tying your animation rate to the frame rate. If you, were, if you were around in the 1980s, you probably were familiar with this. Back in the 1980s, if you had a PC and then you got a faster PC, all the games that you ran on your, on your older PC ran too fast on your faster one. And that's the whole reason why they invented the turbo button, if you remember that. The whole point of the turbo button was that when your turbo button was off, it would act at the same speed as it, as it did before they made computers faster. Um, it turns out that there's a number of applications right now that, aren't, that are tying their animation rate to their frame rate, at least partially, if not entirely. The result of this is that when, you run, when the app runs at 45 hertz, it runs at half speed. Um, and uh, maybe because the shaders are just ticking every other, every other frame uh, and, and how they move forward is a number of things that can cause this. Um, you don't want to do this. Um, technically, this is a problem before ASW existed because any application that's running at 90 and then it misses a few frames is going to be having this problem. You know, if you're, if you're playing some shooter in VR and you encounter some busy scene and then you, you try to shoot but you miss a few frames, you're literally going to be off uh, by uh, some, you know, uh, as, as many as 20 milliseconds or more because of that. So what you need to do is not tie your animation speed to the frame rate. Um, I have some bullet points here about what you can do to help deal with that. If you use... Um, control numpad three, you can force this situation, test your application. Have your play testers run with ASW enabled and control uh, numpad three, and, and then you can just verify that things are going the same visual speed as they were before. All right. Another thing the application does, does wrong, drawing with a pose that doesn't match the next frame. Um, this happens more often than I would have expected, but you, what happens, typically you, sent, you call OVR get tracking state, and then you draw a frame that matches the result of that. You know, you, you get the tracking state for the next frame, you draw for the next frame. It turns out a number of applications, just because of the way their engines are written, are maybe sampling the tracking state quickly in the background multiple times per frame. And the one that they draw, they sometimes pick up the wrong one. And they draw for something that's actually past where they're supposed to be drawing. And the result is that the, the, the view shakes in a, in a certain kind of way. Um, uh, and anyway, there, you can use OVR get I poses frame index to synchronize this. We have some documentation also on uh, our developer site that talks about this. Um, 
Next item, assuming the Rift is on the same view GPU as the main monitor. I talked about this quite a bit before, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. Um, just uh, make sure that the Luid return from OVR create is the one that you generate your devices against. Um, OpenGL applications currently have a problem with this because OpenGL doesn't provide support for this, but we're working with the, um, the vendors and Microsoft on uh, seeing what we can do about this. Um, ignoring API return values. There's one API return value in particular that you need to watch out for, OVR error display lost. OVR error display lost is returned from submit frame upon a GPO TDR. TDR is uh, when, for example, the, 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 the driver crashes, for example. Um, or, you, or you turn it off um, in Windows device management. Um, also, cable disconnects can cause this too. And you, if you detect this error code, you need to recreate uh, your device or you need to quit your application. You need to do something other than keep submitting it. If you keep submitting it, it's just going to be black frames. Uh, there's a surprisingly no large number of applications that have this problem. Um, as I say in the last bullet point, use OVR success and OVR failure macros um, uh, to detect any of these error codes. Um, ignoring visibility status. I mentioned this at the beginning when I first introduced the concept of a, of a uh, TRC. If, if you're not visible, don't, don't do anything. Uh, if you're visible, then you need to do something. Uh, we have an API called OVR Get Session Status. If you've seen that API, that'll tell you whether you're visible, it'll tell you where the headset's on, uh, it'll tell you everything you need to know to handle this properly. If you become invisible, all you have to do is just pull that function. You can just sit there in a loop pulling it, don't, don't do anything else. When, it's, when you get visibility again, you just start drawing again. All right. Um, not detecting IAD changes. There's that little slider. That slider the user can change at any time. That slider represents the user telling the system how far apart their eyes are. Um, you should periodically pull get render desk to tell you where that slider is. Um, and it'll tell you, um, it'll give you the, the, the eye vectors for each eye that you use to set up your uh, poses for drawing. Um, we have an adjust IPD SDK sample app that you can also look at just to, just to get some sample code for that. Um, our, uh, TRC validator app will actually simulate that as it runs and make sure that you responded to that. Uh, not scaling perf. Um, I talked about this a bit before. We have this new adaptive GPU performance scale. This actually is probably the one most surprising thing to me that applications, a large number of applications aren't doing right now. If applications don't meet 90 hertz, you, you scale back, just reduce your eye buffer size if you can't do anything else. Um, and or reduce your complexity if that's, if that's feasible. Um, this is surprisingly easy to, to handle and um, it has a, a surprisingly good return on investment for, for handling it. All right, uh, not using layers. Um, uh, this isn't really a, um, a, a breaking of a rule so much as an optimization that's missed. If you put something that's headlocked in a layer, um, or something that's in a world, fixed world position in a layer that, you, um, that can benefit from it, everything works better. Um, it'll draw smoother. Um, ATW will work correctly on it. Um, uh, it'll be more efficient. Um, yeah. And uh, you can use higher resolutions there. Uh, text, for example, is a good example. You can put higher resolution than when it, when it gets scaled down to your view. It'll be, be nicer. That was it there. Um, there's a few relevant links here. Um, you can also also talk to our developer relations team at any time uh, to ask them questions. Uh, they know all this stuff and can provide you more information than I said here. <laughs>